Happy Sabbath and welcome to the Decolonizing the Black Adventist Mind by yours truly, Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. I am so excited to share this platform with all of you. It is my prayer that people are enlightened, inspired, and that their hearts and spirits are set free as a result of this broadcast. I would now like to introduce our distinguished panelists. I would first like to introduce Dr. Tiffany Llewellyn. Dr. Llewellyn is a migrant of Trinidad and Tobago. She is a certified licensed uh, clinical social worker employed at the John Hopkins University Counseling Center. She is also the president and founder of the faith-based nonprofit Adventists for Social Justice, a movement focused on developing faith-based churches for activism in marginalized communities. Next, we have Pastor Lola Moore Johnston. Pastor Johnston is the senior pastor of the Woodbridge Seventh-day Adventist Church in Virginia. She is the author of the Bible study, Pursued, Stories of Relentless Love of God. She is also an inspirational speaker and empowerment coach behind the Bloom Movement, where she provides tools and strategies to unearth buried potential. Next, we have Dr. Charles Wesley Knight. Dr. Knight is the lead pastor of the Revision Church in Atlanta. He is also the founder of Communiversity, Communiversity Inc., and is an author and activist. Last but not least, we have Minister Ronnie Vanderhorst, who is co-founder of Prepare Our Youth, Inc., in Washington, D.C. I wanted to say a special word about Minister Vanderhorst. Uh, he's been a blessing to not only myself, but I've heard even from every person on the panel that he's inspired and impacted their ministry and life. Uh, he has been a forerunner in helping our faith com community as Seventh-day Adventists think more critically about and living out this mantra, being unashamedly black and unapologetically Christian. And I'm so thankful that each one of you have, uh, have been willing to be a part of this panel. I also want to say an additional thanks to uh, Mr. Kirk Nugent and the composition for facilitating the audiovisual needs for today's program. And I also want to say a special thanks to my wife, Linda, for her help in, uh, in the background. So before we move forward, I, I would ask that our viewers share th this presentation with your friends, loved ones, and family on, on your Facebook page or forward them the YouTube link, or feel free to share directly from my website, drsydneyfreemanjr.com. You'll see it in the uh, right-hand corner of your screen. So before I begin with questions, I would like to ask Pastor Moore Johnston to pray and to invite God's presence into this important discussion. Let's pray together. Lord, we realize that we are standing on holy ground. We are embarking upon a conversation that is much larger than us. And we need your spirit. We pray that even now you would begin to set captives free and that this conversation would be both enlightening and uplifting. May you be seen, known, and heard is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And I want to do, thank you for that prayer. I want to do just some brief housekeeping. I have several questions that I will be, will be starting our conversation with. After that, we will go to a quick commercial break 
and then we will take questions from the audience. Please feel free to enter your questions in the chat on YouTube and in the comments on Facebook. I will try to get to as many questions as we can within the time that we have. And before our main questions, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page about uh, what we mean by the term black, as it is going to be key in framing our conversation today. So I would define the term black as a, any person who is a member of the African diaspora, which which could include, but not limited to, African, uh, excuse me, American descendants of slaves, those who are melanated and born on the continent of Africa. It could be someone that is Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latinx, Black Europeans, Afro-Asians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now let's jump into some of the questions. And I wanna throw this out to Minister Vanderhorst to get us started. What is decolonizing the black mind mean? And is it important? Elder Neely Fuller, who is, or who was the mentor of Dr. Frances Cress Wells, and she's now an ancestor, but many of you know her. She was an incredible, eminent um, psychiatrist based in Washington, D.C. Elder Neely Fuller um, posited something called the nine areas of people activity, and that is economics, entertainment, education, law, media, politics, religion, sex, which is family, war, and so forth. Well, all nine areas of people activity have been functionaries of white supremacy global domination. It doesn't matter which one, um, which institution it is. And all of these institutions have socialized everyone who has come into the world, including black people. For the sake of this, this discussion, we are talking about religion. Therefore, religion is also a functionary of white supremacy, global <clears throat> domination, and it has been used against black people. It has been used to colonize black people. Um, I can even mention um, in the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, uh, you had employees who um, could not eat in the same uh, cap cafeteria with them. Lewis B. Reynolds, um, in his book We Have Tomorrow, speaks about that. He could not uh, use the same bathroom as Seventh-day Adventists in the General Conference and so forth. So it was not the Holy Spirit who changed the minds. It was the law that had mm. to change the minds. And especially in all of these um, areas of people activity. Therefore, and succinctly then, I would say that decolonizing the Adventist mind is basically coming out of a mental exodus of that which we have been indoctrinated in, that we have internalized, and also what has institutionalized our minds with the lies that have been given to us through this particular institution. Wow, wow. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Pastor Johnston. <clears throat> I look to Revelation 14 that tells us that there is an angel that is to come to people and the everlasting gospel would be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And so in Revelation 14, there is an expectation that the gospel would go to people and that it would be superimposed as the way that people live. But what happened in the decimation of Christianity and Adventism is that white culture was given to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And so rather than the, the kingdom of God being teached, it was white culture teached. 
And so to me, decolonizing the black mind, the black Adventist mind is restoring the place of the kingdom as what is lived as truth rather than white culture and white supremacy. So it's so it seems for our first two panelists that that it's going to be important. It's important to decolonize our minds to move forward. Could you speak to that, Pastor Knight? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so this this word colonization really comes from this understanding that to colonize is to seek to control an indigenous people. Right. And if and if we use that kind of definition, then we must understand that uh, that Africans really and this is both historically and even what could say biblically, Africans are the indigenous people, people from Africa throughout the diaspora historically are the indigenous people of faith. It, it's already been spoken, the fact that the Garden of Eden more likely was in, in fact, it's been conclusively said, was in some part on the continent of Africa. So this whole issue of colonization is to seek to control those who already had indigenous faith. They didn't teach us. We knew the creator God long before they showed up. We already have books, uh, many of them written by some of our own black pastors and theologians that help us to understand. I think C.E. Bradford also talked about this, how the Sabbath was already in parts of Africa, perhaps specifically we could name Ethiopia. So the colonization is the fact that they have sought to, they have sought to control those who already had faith in the creator God. We already knew Yah or Yahweh. And so decolonization in a real sense is a return back to the faith that we had before they came to our shores. Wow, thank, thank you for that. Um, Tiffany, could you, uh, Dr. Llewellyn, could you please kind of talk, talk to this notion of decolonizing our minds? But I was thinking about how it could connect to your work with regards to evidence for social justice. How, uh, is there a connection between, between the two? Yeah, so when I think about the term uh, decolonization, particularly for Adventist, Black Adventists, um, I think of words like deprogramming, um, deconstructing, dismantling uh, in many ways, uh, thinking about power and who holds power in what ways. And, you know, as a clinician, I always think about anything related to race or racialized trauma or racial colonization in whatever ways um, as an operating system. And so when I think about decolonization, it makes me think of how then do Black Adventists need to deprogram themselves? Mm -hmm. We know that when we think of an operating system, something has to be shut down, uninstalled, and something new has to be reinstalled. Um, and so in what ways uh, do we connect that mind, body, spirit, like Godfather likes to say, to ensure that when we restart, we are truly operating from a new system uh, that ties into what everyone else has already shared. And so in the work of ASJ, particularly Black Adventists who align with Adventists for Social Justice, it certainly connects because embedded in colonization has come oppression and structural uh, racism and marginalization and particular groups who are most impacted by colonization when we talk about economic, political, cultural power. Um, and so in the work of Adventists for Social Justice, the hope is to help help us understand the connections through how we deprogram our minds so that we can engage social justice work through the lens of understanding the influence on colonization and how we think, behave, and operate. Wow. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Llewellyn. I'm, I think we've laid a good foundation for the need the need for a decolonization process, uh, particularly for our faith community. Um, could you, could someone speak to, maybe maybe Dr. Knight, could you speak to um, what a decolonization process would look like personally for people 
and maybe even corporately as a body of believers? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Freeman. So I, I, I was really looking forward to this question because I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to get rid of, uh, again, as and I like the way you said, like like the Godfather says, who is Vanderhorst, uh, <laughs> one of my great mentors. Um, one of the things we have to understand is, is that it first starts with the mind and then those the way that you think then impacts the way that you deal with the world around you. So it would be, we start with theos, our understanding of God, and then uh, ethnos, our understanding of people, and then methodos, the way that we deal with people. Theo theologically, we have to start there since this is a Christian conversation around decolonization, which means we have to get rid of white Jesus. We have to. If we're going to talk about both personally and corporately, we have to get rid of, deconstruct, put aside this notion, this icon of white supremacy, which is white Jesus. In a presentation that I made to a group in the UK a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I took some time to just deconstruct this whole notion of a white Jesus and how it is indeed an icon of white supremacy. And you cannot overthrow white supremacy colonization, in uh, imperialism, in any form, while still serving, while still worshiping, while still praising a white Jesus. Um, and so I think both personally and corporately, we have to start there. Because white Jesus is not only bad for black people, historically and experientially, it's not good for, for white people. It's not good for us, it's not even good for them. If we're going to overthrow it, then we have to begin to say, why is it that if I say to this audience that Jesus is black, that we automatically, even though we might not show it, react because we've been taught and trained to never question the norm, which is whiteness, when geographically, historically, and theologically, as Dr. James Cone says, Jesus is black in terms of his experience. Jesus was born a Jew as a margin, part of a marginalized community under Roman oppression and subjugation. So that Jesus, who is the personification of the heart of God, shows us that God is closest to those who are oppressed, that he chose to come and be part of a marginalized people. And so the first thing we've got to do, and, and you know, as someone already said, we gotta overthrow systems, but we will never overthrow systems if theologically our mindset is that God is white, because if we try to overthrow a white system, we then have to dethrone a white Jesus. Wow. Wow. Uh, Pastor Johnston. Oh, I just, oh, I'm looking at the comments. They're coming in. They're on. They're on. <laughs> you know, um, one thing that I think would add, as Dr. Knight said, to the changing of the mind is also learning a value of critique. Mm -hmm. I believe that a part of Adventist lifestyle is not critiquing anything that we have been taught. And because we have not critiqued, then we don't realize that Adventism is not only a system of belief, it's also a culture. And ingrained in that culture are values that are in keeping with white supremacy. And so because we have not been taught to ask questions or to take personal responsibility for what we believe and where it comes from, then we have wholesale accepted not only biblical understandings, but also a cultural understanding. We have to deconstruct our beliefs. We have to ask questions of what we have been taught. We have to critically, like the Bereans, not take the word of the evangelist or the pastor, but like we say, you know, that we are asking Baptists and Pentecostals to do of their pastors, we have to go back to the word and critically search and see if what we have heard from the pulpit, what we have read in the book, in the publication, is in keeping with the word of God. And oftentimes I have found in my own studies that what has been presented from a pulpit is mixed biblical understanding with personal understanding mm -hmm. and white supremacy. We have to deconstruct that and ask critical questions. 
Well, I'm going to jump in with a question from from the chat here, and anyone can can answer this. Do you think that uh, colonization of Adventism was intentional or a function slash consequence of of the larger society? Yes and no. I think that there are places where oppressed peoples have spoken out about the ways in which the values and ideologies of Adventism cuts against the value of culture and Adventism has bucked back. In those places, I believe that there is some intentionality there. I think that there are other places where people just taught what they had been taught. But there are some places where in 2020, people are asking about the way that general conference programming is put together and why certain amounts of, or certain types of music, certain types of preaching are not involved. And in these places where there are opportunities now to critique and make change, those changes are not being made, then it becomes intentional. I would, uh, in, in following up with that, uh, I am a product of Seventh-day Adventist Christian education from pre-K through my bachelor's degree. All my educational experiences are within our, our institutions besides my graduate degrees. Uh, could you talk about maybe someone, uh, Elder Knight or Pastor Johnston, just about our educational system in relationship to the colonization, even Black Adventist education, uh, since both of you have, have attended uh, our institutions? Well, I, <laughs> let me say it this way. Uh, we have done, we have done a disservice. I think that, you know, we take for granted that, okay, I went to school in mostly um, black Adventist schools, but it was not until I got to Oakwood University that I actually started learning, uh, learning things in the classroom. I was doing my own reading. And once again, like, thanks to that, uh, pastor, or I should say Elder Vanderhorst in 10th grade when he came to Oakwood Academy, that's when I first realized that you can be an Adventist and be socially conscious. Because up to then, my African-American education coming from Canada was more so listening to Public Enemy, KRS-One, Boogie Down Productions, and Louis Farrakhan. I, when, when Vanderhorst showed up, I didn't know Adventists could talk like that. Um, and what he did not know was in my mind, I was making up my mind, making, trying to make a decision whether I was going to actually stay in Adventism because I thought that I was invisible even in the Black Adventist educational system because we never talked about us. We never talked about our contributions to history, to, me to science, to art. Um, we never, we never talked about that. We simply used the books that the GC gave us that that actually fortified a white supremacist idea. So you got black kids going through an entire black Adventist system, and this is not to paint the broad with a broad brush. There are some schools, I'm sure, who do who do that work. There are some, but widely we have we have accepted a system that teaches us to be good Adventists. And that definition leaves out your African identity. Wow. And I want to follow up um, with the story. Um, I believe I was seven or eight when um, I made a statement that now makes me sad. Um, a neighbor of mine brought a coloring book where there was a picture of Malcolm X. And when I saw the picture, I said, I can't color that because Malcolm X is a devil worshiper. I said that. I had believed that because he was not Christian, because he was not Seventh-day Adventist, that I could not engage Malcolm X. I'm not saying that that's 
that's everyone's story. But I was a good Adventist. I was a part of a Seventh-day Adventist educational system, but I had not been introduced to him and his contributions to blackness. Um, and I think that there are places, as Dr. Nye said, there are places that are doing that work, but wholly our educational system is built to perpetuate Adventism which is in many places um, counter to at a uh, black, what should I say, blackness in all of its forms. We are taught to shun our families when they are not Adventists, when they're not Christian, because they eat pork, because they dance, because they drink. We are taught to be, to come aside, which community is a foundational principle in blackness, in black, black community, black culture. And so is. I want to say that although there are some who have not intentionally done this, that I believe the educational system can be a way in which that um, white supremacy is perpetuated. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I, I want to still go back to that initial question because I want to make sure we hear from Dr. Llewellyn and, and Minister Vanderhorst in regards to uh, in regards to the process of decolonizing our minds. Let's, I'll throw that to Dr. Llewellyn first and then to uh, Minister Vanderhorst. Yeah, so I came across this quote by uh, one African scholar in Guji Tiango. Um, and the scholar says that to understand colonization is understanding that it unleashed a cultural bomb on African people annihilating their belief in their names, language, heritage, and capacity to see themselves. He, stated, he further states that this bombing causes them to identify with that which is furthest removed from themselves, with other people's language, other people's expressions, and other people's styles of worship. That led me down a rabbit hole of studying phenomenology through a neuropsychological lens. Because although on one hand I understand um, that by decolonizing Jesus, we decolonize ourselves, as, doc as Dr. Knight talked about, why Jesus. Um, but I wanted to take it maybe a little step before we even get to theology and understand through uh, phenomenology Black people's subconscious thinking and their, con their, their conscious and their subconscious. Because I do believe that a lot of times within our church, when we talk about colonization, we think solely of, the the of theology. But the fact is, until we get into people's conscious and subconscious mind and really helping individuals understand how that shows up. So the structure of consciousness, um, how you view yourself in any space how things appear in your experience, how you experience things and the meanings that you attach to those things. These are all critical aspects of the decolonization process um, that I have been really digging myself into, particularly as I talk about racialized trauma, because phenomenology really looks at not just time, but ourselves, others, objects, events, tools, I mean, every single thing is connected in our conscious and subconscious awareness. And until we really dig into our mind in that way and connect it to our cognitive thinking and how that then influences our behaviors, that for me is where I see the process beginning uh, because people have become so resistant to you even touch on Jesus saying white and the pushback is just crazy. Why is that? And so we have to go really into people's conscious and subconscious, make connections to even the brain. I mean, this thing is so deep to me because when we think about how the brain works, the prefrontal cortex, our hippocampus, our amygdala, the our lobes, the memories, the dates, the things that have been ingrained and entrenched to the core of our brain matter. Until we really bring decolonization into a neuropsychological phenomenology, phen phenomenology lens, 
I don't think that we can even begin to get people to understand why white Jesus is not okay. Uh, to even begin to understand the education, the educational system and how it has impacted them. And so I really, really uh, believe that a neuropsychological approach to decolonization as Adventists is critical uh, and necessary. Wow. Uh, I Elder totally Redder. I totally and completely concur with that. You know, Dr. Desmond Tutu said, when the white missionary came to Africa, we had the land and he had the Bible. He said, let us pray. And when we opened our eyes, he had the land and we had the Bible. <laughs> yeah. And it's still like that today. Because uh, uh, my favorite psychologist, Dr. Bobby Wright, writes a book called The Psychopathic Racial Personality. And he brings forth a construct called menticide. And he says menticide is the deliberate and systematic destruction of a group's mind with the ultimate purpose being the extirpation of that group. So I looked up the word extirpation. X means out of stirps is the trunk of a tree. What is menticide, um, uh, white supremacy? What does it do? It pulls up by the roots our minds, that which has been implanted, our identity, it pulls up and, and, and it has its collateral damage there. But dealing with that whole process of the mind and um, Dr. Llewellyn um, elucidated on that. You have um, neuro associations. You have a lot of stuff that really impacts our thought processes. So therefore, you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. Mm -hmm. And the root of all maladjustment is in the thinking. Uh, the African Hebrew Solomon says, as a man or woman thinketh, so is he, so is she. So if our behavior is going to change, it has to be dealt with at the level of our thought process, at the level of our mind, at the root, so that we can see uh, to produce different fruit in our yeah. personal lives, our families, our affiliations, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there was a question that went directly to something that Dr. Knight said, so I want to get it right now since it's, it's hot. Uh, the statement was from Brandon Wolf, which said, Dr. Knight lightly touched on this, but colonization hurts white people as well, considering that their whole theological and cultural understanding is rooted in a lie. At which point do we prioritize exposing this lie and decolonizing their minds as well? Or should we just focus on our own? Mm, good question, good question. I think that we have to, I don't know if we should and if it's even effective to take this time, our energies, our passions to be able to try to decolonize, to argue, to debate, to get them to see that white Jesus, that colonization hurts them as well. I think we need to focus on us as, uh, and, and for those who want to come to the table, those who want to lend an ear. It was interesting when I made this presentation about how Jesus is black um, and how Jesus, I actually made the case that Jesus would actually support and we should support Black Lives Matter movement as well. And no, not just the idea, but the actual movement um, is because I, I think one of the reasons, we have white folks who are listening and all of the, all of the re response that I got back was, I never really heard a Christian pastor, particularly Adventist, talk about it this way. So I think that if we do it rooted in truth, people who are seeking truth outside of our community will listen and they will learn. But we, we don't have time, nor should we use our energy to keep having this conversation with people who are rooted in this white supremacist idea. And by the way, we should note, I think, Dr. Freeman, you you put this in your article that you and your co-author wrote, which I thought was very insightful, by the way. You talked about the fact that how the Adventist church was founded in this nation. All of the other denominations actually are transports mm -hmm. from Europe and other places. The white Adventist church is uniquely, I should say the Adventist church is uniquely an American institution that was then exported to the rest of the world. So we actually exported 
our uh, racist views, which is why when general conference comes around and we vote, this is part of the reason why we always vote a white male in and never vote anyone that looks like Ooh. us because we actually exported our unique brand of racism to every other part of the world in the name of Jesus. Wow. That, that's heavy. I, I have. Yeah, and it's, it's serious too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to throw this question uh, to Dr. Llewellyn. Uh, she's, she's talked a little bit about uh, racialized trauma, uh, but one of the things that I've learned over the past few years is that uh, as an American descendant of slaves uh, here on these, on these shores, um, that it's not, it's not just, it's not just us that has been affected, but all across the diaspora, there has, there has been this colonization process that has impacted us even, even on the continent. Could you speak to, uh, the unique, maybe some of the unique challenges that there may be, uh, across the diaspora regarding decolonizing our minds? Yeah, so I had the, I guess, privilege at this point to be raised uh, in a country and in a village when I was not Adventist, right? Um, and so when I was growing up in Tobago, watching Adventists in that context was always very interesting, not just to me, but it, w it almost became like, a part of what we did as kids, just kind of watching how Adventists behave uh, in our village. We would be going to the river, they don't come to the river. We would be, you know, playing in the village, the Adventist children don't play with us. They don't engage with us, uh, with the rest of us in our, <laughs> in our natural habitat. It's just, mm -hmm. Adventism has always been very removed from the rest of society and i remember even being raised in that context as a child in fact i remember when i was younger my great grandmother would say why can't you be more like those adventist girls and wear your stockings to church and i just couldn't understand having to wear stockings to church in the hot tobago sun it just didn't make sense so all always there has always been for me you know this dichotomy between being at venice and being everything else um from very very young and when i moved here to the u.s i think is where it became even more uh present where at the church that i came into adventism into as a teenager in brooklyn i remember when we were planning a nature sabbath a day a sabbath in nature and all the Caribbean parents refused to send their children. For them, being in nature on the Sabbath was evil. It was desecrating the Sabbath. There was no way that you can spend Sabbath uh, in nature. And I had a lot of conversation on how could it be possible that Nature is natural to us where we come from. We're all from the Caribbean. We all grew up near the beaches, near the rivers, near the gardens, etc. Where did we get this teaching that God can't meet us in our natural environment? That the only place that we can worship and experience God is by coming into a building. Who taught us that? Where did that come from? And so it's just been a very interesting process for me um, understanding all of that. When I think about the experiences, particularly colonization um, as an Adventist uh, in America, I think from with Caribbean descent, I think it's been more prevalent around social justice work um, and looking at just the distancing um, of ourselves, of our communities by far and by large from that work uh, the idea that we are somehow a different kind of black, um, a better kind of black, uh, a more holy, sacred kind of black that's smarter, better in every single way, which again is another part of how colonization rears its head because the goal is to always separate so that power just can't be collective in our community. Um, and so looking at that, looking at how in many Caribbean spaces, 
Uh, I don't ever remember in my younger days in Adventism hearing about individuals like uh, Stokely Carmichael, who's from Trinidad and such an av activist, who had been such an activist, um, or other Caribbean activists who had been doing that work. These were just not conversations being had uh, in our space. And so for me, it's been really looking at the behaviors of us as Caribbean individuals, the distancing that happens often um, to the larger African American community, um, and how we really remove ourselves from the need to really explore systemic oppression, systemic uh, marginal marginalization in many ways, and see ourselves as a part of that. So that's really been my experience. Wow. Wow. Dr. Freeman, could I, if I could, I mean, because, uh, you know, uh, like, like Dr. Llewellyn was saying, you know, she's actually, she's from Tobago, um, beautiful place. Uh, coming from Canada, what I don't know if all of your viewers understand, but me being Canadian coming from Canada, when you're an Adventist, a black Adventist in Canada, you're either African or what, what we call West Indian colloquially. So my parents are from the West Indies. So I'm, I'm also a product of, the, of that culture and proud of it. And one of, the, one of the things that I discovered is I had a couple family members, and we might as well just, just be honest today, a couple people who would say when I moved to the States at the age of 12, 13, say stuff like, well, you know, Americans, black Americans are lazy. Okay. Now, where did we get, where did they get that from? They got that from, it's not like they were in conversation with American Adventists, but they were in conversation and community with white Canadians, which are part of the white power structure of Adventism, which then gives this, as Dr. Llewellyn referred to, this tries to make this division between African Americans and African Caribbeans. And that's part of the colonization power play. You, you have to do that. And so this is why, although there have been very gifted people, whether they be from the African Afro-Caribbean community or indigenous African-Americans, very gifted people who could be perhaps the same level of gifting, but historically our church would promote the Afro-Caribbean above the indigenous African-American here to cause division. And I think that if we're going to talk about decolonization, we have to start having those open conversations for us to understand that we all really are the same people and we can't keep letting them play this game on us because it happens all the time. And there's certain pockets of the country where there's large percentages of uh, a large percentage of African Caribbean people, New York, Northeast being part of part of those places, Florida, particularly South Florida where this dynamic happens all the time. And we're not going to get over if we keep being divided by that, that power play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I notice is that many times when I've tried to get engaged in that dialogue, just having a really frank, open dialogue, a lot of times there's kind of this goal to, to come to this kumbaya, kind of this... Uh, we should, if, if I talk about there's differences between um, what I'm calling ADOS, a uh, American descendants of, of slaves, and the Car those from the Caribbean, and those from Africa, it's like, no, we shouldn't have, it's like that, we should, we're all one in Christ. It's kind of like, it's the same kind of shutdown that you would have with, um, with kind of broader, kind of broader conversation. And I feel like, this is just my personal opinion that we won't get free unless we're able to be honest about some of those differences and move and move forward but i'll, I'll still keep we it open to. we we have to get honest about it i'll just add this as an example i remember sitting down with one of my friends here in the u.s uh Datrian Pileggi, who we had a very honest uh conversation about her history as an african-american all her connections being here in the u.s and, and mine as a caribbean and she shared with me um you know caribbeans come here and they call us lazy in all these different terms because we won't babysit because we won't watch white people's children and clean white people's houses um 
without understanding and she shared you know her grandparents saying to her i would rather die than know that you ever uh took care of a white person's child or cleaned a white person's house just based on the history of African Americans here. And so on just as one example. And so until we really sit and have conversations with each other and understand the realities that we come from, because many times we migrate and it's survival by any means necessary. We are just here to make money, send it back home, bring our families, really establish ourselves. And so many of the jobs that we see as, you know, being hardworking or willing to do whatever it takes to take care of ourselves that we then judge other individuals for without understanding how deep that history runs, that it's not just taking care of white babies or cleaning white houses, but it's rooted in a much deeper, much more traumatic story and experience experience, mm. then we really will not be able to have the healing amongst ourselves that's necessary um, and hear each other. Because I I got in a lot of trouble when I made my Facebook post for my Caribbean people a couple months ago. I'm still in trouble about it uh, because a lot of times Caribbean individuals then feel like, well, we have also been hurt and called names by African Americans and dismissed. And so there's just a lot of room for talking and hearing and listening to each other so that we can move forward. Mm -hmm. There is um, something that I have been processing, and it is, you know, from a little thing that I say, never discuss the fruit without understanding the root. Colonization is not a causative, it is a response. And I believe that it is a response to white sovereignty. Understand that because white sovereignty is that which actually um, is the umbrella of controlling through the institutions that are functionaries of white supremacy. So um, blacks are in a white sovereign nation. And as we are dealing with colonization, we, as this discussion is, we understand that this thing, decolonization is going to be a process. You know, it's not going to be an overnight thing. It's not going to be one panel and that's it. This has to be many panels. It has to, you know, ripple out into different aspects and gradations of dealing with decolonization. But I will say this, as I believe that the end game or the product or byproduct of decolonization of the Adventist mind is sovereignty mm. for blacks, for black Adventists, sovereignty. And I'm gonna say it. I believe that, uh, see, because by 1919, 90% of blacks in America were in black run denominations, AME, Pentecostal, and so forth. Only 10% of blacks joined white denominations. Black Adventists, even with regional conferences, is not known as the black church. We are known as a white church. I remember back in the day, Ebony Magazine used to have on the cover the 50 top black preachers. None of them were ever Adventists because they weren't, we're not in a black denomination. It is a white run denomination, period. Mm -hmm. So with regional conferences, still white run. But the byproduct of the decolonization of the Adventist mind, if it does not lead to sovereignty, then we will continue to reshuffle chairs on the deck of the Titanic. <laughs> Oakwood College, regional conferences, Pine Forge Academy, Message Magazine, Sovereignty. They will get the support, the infrastructure, the, the strategic plans and so forth. But I'm telling you, if it does not lead to sovereignty, we will begin to see and possibly already happening. And this might be the last thing I'll say on here is already happening. You will see individual sovereign men and women 
um, fellowships, uh, pastors, uh, ministers who come out of this system, completely out, not because of being disgruntled, not because of self-aggrandizement, but because they have a call and gifts that are broader than the parameters of this constricted denomination will permit them to use, and they have to do kingdom work. And so therefore, sovereignty will be inevitable, individually or corporately. Um, and, 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 and this is it. When the most people in the African Hebrew construct back then did not recognize when the presence had risen up and left. When, when, when Yahshua went back to heaven, my God, the first group which was called the way was a sovereign affiliation. They did not go back under that Jewish construct to cut lamb's throats and all the rest of this. They brought their resources together and they, they did severally as to help one another. They were sovereign in their import and the savior, the, the apostle Saul, Paul, none of them contradicted it at all. It was inevitable. I'm going to get down off my, my soapbox right now. But I'm going to tell you, sovereignty is the byproduct of the decolonization of the African, the black Adventist mind. Can I, if I, if Pastor Johnson, I'm going to just say this. Can somebody put in the comments, hashtag sovereignty? Hashtag I got you right now. I got you right now. Pastor Johnson, come on. You know, and... <laughs> to, I want to say Dr. Vanderhoor, so I'm going to just call you Dr. Vanderhoor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in connection to what he said, we have to understand, and, and let's just lump everything that has been said so far, that to the core of our being, we have been taught that Adventism is our ticket to heaven, okay? Mm -hmm. And so many of us have believed that unless we are connected with the organized Seventh-day Adventist church that is located here in the United States, that we are in jeopardy of not being saved. And so mm -hmm. when people talk about sovereignty, many of us are rocked to the core because subconsciously we have not imagined a reality walking into eternity without being connected to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Mm. We have been taught this as a part of our ingraining as we were baptized, we, you know, being a part of God's remnant church and all of this stuff. The language we have been taught in our education, in kindergarten, in primary school, and all of this has yeah. been taught that we have to be connected to this organization in order for us to be saved. And so I believe that there is a nuance to decolonizing the black Adventist mind that is not even present for those who are non-Adventist. Right. Because not only do we have to be disconnected from white supremacy, we have to be disconnected from Adventist supremacy, which is a whole <laughs> new nuance, a whole <laughs> other nuance. Where if we are not a part of this church, we, this is why many people are still connected today. It is not necessarily because we want to be connected, but it's because from the root, from the basil, <laughs> like from the mind, the root of our mind, we cannot imagine being saved without being a part of this organization. So as, mm -hmm. as we are talking about uh, disconnecting ourselves from white supremacy, we have to go back to scripture and understand the nature of true salvation and remember that it is not in connection with an organization until we understand that we will continue to take whatever supremacy brings to us we will continue to deal with looking at publications that don't highlight black people none of my books dr knight none of my books as I was coming up through Adventist education, uh, uh, Dr. Freeman, none of them had black people in them. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was all white values. We will continue to take it, continue to give our dollars to these institutions until we realize that salvation is not dependent on our Adventists. 
So, so yeah. to what yeah. uh, Elder Vanderhorst said, he mentioned some of our premier organizations through our Adventist Oregon. So, so Pine Forge, where I graduated from, Oakwood University, Message Magazine, where I'm on a new board for all these. What? So people like Mike, myself. What should we be? Do, what's the role? of these organizations now since we're calling for sovereignty and saying that we're in a a system of Adventist supremacy as uh, Pastor Johnston said what's the move what's as a member uh, and as maybe if we had some if we had a regional conference president that was watching this if we had the president of Oakwood and these other institutions what would we be saying to them? Well, well, before we, well, as we answer that, let me say this. I think we first have to understand so that people aren't just sh shocked by this conversation by sovereignty, <laughs> is that the fact that none of us are shocked, nor do many of us seem to be really, really bothered or something would have changed by now, that we've been living in a white sovereignty in terms of the Adventist context. Wow. I think that's one thing that we need to we need to understand. <laughs> that while there might be those who would push back and say, wait, wait a minute, this is going in a different direction. How come none of us have stopped to say, wait a minute, we've been living under white sovereignty this entire time. And white Adventists, for the most part, we always know there's some exceptions, but for the most part, have never stopped to question their sovereignty. So I think to free our minds to be able to even talk this talk, we need to understand that our brothers and sisters who've been leading this white sovereignty, they're fine with it in their Christianity. I think we need to be fine with having this conversation. Yeah, when I think about these entities, you know, a couple questions that come up for me are, you know, these entities being in place, does it mean that uh, the black culture, black uh, relationship with God, these sorts of things are prioritized or valued? Not necessarily. Um, when I even think about why regional conferences, for example, came into being, it was never integrated in. It was kind of like, take this on the side and yeah, you guys can have your thing over there. Um, it also makes me think about in whose interests uh, predominantly are these resources and entities organized for and organized within? Uh, and to what degree do we have control over our own dynamic? And as I think about all these different entities in light of those questions, it brings me continuously back to a uh, white and Venice framework. Everything that we are doing even though we have these entities continue to happen and must occur under the same umbrella. And so by these entities existence, and I in no way want to diminish the powerful work that they all do, it still does not bring us closer to decolonization in any way, just merely by their existence. The other thing with uh, sovereignty that I think can potentially harm us is thinking that What's going to happen is all Black and Venice are going to get up and agree to sovereignty, and then we will move forward. And I think if we wait for everyone to agree and get on board, we will never move forward. It must take courage, and for whichever president or whoever leader might be watching, uh, it's very much individual as it is collective. And so I think that, you know, some of us are, are tiptoeing the conversation in certain places, throwing it out there in certain ways and waiting for this collective move that we will all agree on. And I don't believe that that's how sovereignty will occur. Um, and so I really want us to think about the individual and collective ways that we may have to move forward, even if every black person doesn't move. That's, that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty of mind precedes sovereignty collectively. Mm -hmm. If we don't go through a process for the sovereignty of our own mind, you know, that's where it begins back. That's where it connects back 
again, as Dr. Llewellyn talked about, those deep-seated, that the, the conscious and unconscious, basically, that has embalmed our minds all these particular years. And so there's a mental sovereignty that should precede or um, operate simultaneously with um, a personal or collective strategic plan of sovereignty. But I want to drop this in, and I know that um, Pastor Johnston um, has a powerful articulation on that because um, a, a, a serious specific area of decolonization of the black Adventist mind has to do with Ellen G. White, who is not the spirit of prophecy, never I was. Mm -hmm. Ellen White had the gift of prophecy, but one of my spiritual gifts is the gift of prophecy. And in these last days, sons and daughters will prophesy, but they keep looking back to 1844 and missing present revelation that's been coming through, you see. So, so, but, but Ellen White is a sacred cow, maybe at the top of it, you see. And she is not the 67th book of the Bible, nor is she the final authority of the Adventist church, quote unquote. But Ellen White, through white supremacist leadership and so forth, and black internalized or institutional uh, uh, persons, Ellen White has been the, the number one woman in the church who has been pimped all these years. <laughs> number one, economically, I mean, buku money off of Ellen White. But now that she's not bringing in the cash like she used to with the compilations that brought in more money and take it out of context, now Ellen White has been used for control all these years to whip blacks back into shape. Or what are you talking about sovereignty? Ellen White said, Come on now. <laughs> <Didn't I? laughs> you know, if, if James White had some guts, he should have sucker punched a lot of cats <laughs> taking his wife out of context and saying stuff there. But you know, that's a whole nother panel there. <laughs> but but the black avidus mind, if we don't get soft, if we don't get decolonized off of Ellen White and her being placed back into the proper context, mm -hmm. then you know we'll, we'll 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 get beat to stay in our place. It'll be a whip. Uh, Dr. Johnson, um, you know I'm passing the baton to you. Okay, Doc, you gonna you gonna take me there? All right, let's do it. Let's do work. <laughs> Understand that while Ellen White lived, the leadership of the Seventh Day Adventist Church hated her. You have to know this that she was put on a boat to Australia. I went to Australia once. Doc, you probably been to Australia. It was a 15 hour flight from Los Angeles. I had to fly to Los Angeles and then get on a flight 15 hours to Australia. They put that old woman on a boat to Australia because they wanted mm -hmm. not to hear her anymore. You have to understand the kind of hatred that you have to have for somebody to put a little yeah. old lady on a boat to Australia. And this is what the Adventist leadership relationship was to Ellen White while she lived because she critiqued the system. Mm -hmm. While she lived, the people did not want to hear from her. But after 1915, when she died, they took the writings that she had and used them as a source of income. Now I want you to think about your grandma and the people in the church who have talked about your grandmother and abused her <laughs> and how you would feel if after your grandmother died, then the same people who hated your grandmother, the same people who abused your grandmother, then utilized her special recipe in order to bankroll their church. You would be wow. incensed. This is what happened when we look at the history of Ellen White and the Seventh Day Adventist Church. She was used after she died. They didn't want present revelation. They wanted uh, something that was systematized and organized for profit. 
Now, it's not to say, now understand that I believe that Ellen White had the gift of prophecy. She was the messenger of God. I believe that she had a word for the people in the time. I thank God for her ministry, but her ministry was never meant in her own words to be what it has become today. It has become a, a, a tool of manipulation. And when we realize that she has been used, not her herself, but her legacy has been used as a tool of manipulation, then we ask, well, what is the spirit of prophecy? Well, Joel says that in the last days that God's gonna pour his spirit out on all flesh and that sons and daughters would prophesy. It was intended that God's people all would have this spiritual gift where they could speak words that were important, speak words that were seasoned with the spirit of God to the times. But because we have been colonized using this manipulative tool, then we have believed that men and women are no longer enabled to speak authoritatively in the moment with the spirit of God. The spirit of, of prophecy is God's spirit moving in God's people, not a bunch of books collecting dust on your bookshelf. Wow. That's good. That's good. Hey, Dr. Freeman, can I jump in here? They, yeah. Y'all are serious. All right. So <laughs> that, that's what, what, they, what they're talking about, I mean, is actually revolutionary for the Adventist mind, since we're talking about the Black Adventist mind, because... We got to understand that prophecy, we were kind of taught, well, not kind of, we were actually taught. In fact, we were trained to see prophecy as only this one phase of prophecy, which is more predictive. It is more the, you know, the Daniel revelation and what does that mean and all that. Whereas when we talk about now prophecy in the wider lens, even from the Old Testament all the way through New Testament, and even the ministry of Jesus, the prophetic ministry includes challenging powers and structures that oppress people spiritually, mentally, and otherwise. That's part of the prophetic ministry, which takes into account the work, the activists, those who do the work of social justice. See, the, because we have such a narrow definition of prophecy, that's why people are able to use Ellen White to turn around and say, we shouldn't be engaged in social justice when you got to understand that prophecy is much larger than telling you what's going to happen in the future. In fact, most of the biblical prophets spoke to people who were in power. They spoke truth to power. They talked about evil in all of its form, including whether it be ethnic issues or socioeconomic issues, which we see in the book of Isaiah. So I do think that this issue, because you're right, if we don't change our definition, that's you know, that's why I'm even doing a course on this whole thing of prophecy is because we have to rediscover and widen the lens to see that the work of justice is part of being having the gift of prophecy. Hmm. What's what's so interesting to me, just as a lay member on this panel, it reminds me of this story that I heard um, on the 1916 podcast, where the host, Nicole Hannah, recounted the story of her aunt being baptized in the Mississippi Tallahassee River. And every time her aunt would recount the baptism story and the church that she was baptized into, there was no recollection or awareness she talks about that this was the same river that Emmett Till's body was found in. That yeah. part of the story was always erased. She was never even given that history, that narrative to be a part of her Christian, you know, coming to be a revelation. It was just always about where she met God, how she met God and how she got baptized. And in many ways, it feels like Adventism is the very same way when we talk about black Adventism, when we talk about decolonizing the mind or even Ellen G. White. It's this idea that when you come into here, don't ask us no questions about you know who Ellen G. White really was. The true stories, the real stories, Ellen G. White leaving in her will for the funding from her books to go to the black community. Like none of these truths we get to question or talk about. Everything has to be left in the baptism river. And when you when you get up after baptism, you are baptized into this white culture, this white mm. understanding of God, and you must leave all your history, all your truths, everything mm. that can truly help you understand the larger picture in the water 
other. And so I think this is so critical and when we talk about decolonization, because every single part of what the panels are talk the panelists are talking about, I learned from from black leaders, from black teachers, from black preachers. And so we really have to practically, I think, break down how are we going to shift unlearn relearn all these fall the, the lies that we have been told uh, and really get to the truth to liberate god's people mm -hmm. I, I want to uh, ask uh, pastor johnston uh to speak to a question uh for those who are on um a part of the wakanda fellowship uh group if you did not hear last night's sermon by Pastor Johnston, it was a, uh, we were talking about prophetic. It was a prophetic sermon for this time. Um, and there's a lot of discussion going on on social media about different things. And of course we wanna be, we, we as Black Adventists wanna be relevant um, to the times. How can a decolonized mind help us to be relevant to our communities uh, at large beyond just the uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, faith community? Well, I believe that a decolonized mind would actually recognize what's happening around us. When I was growing up, I oftentimes heard um, a response to several social ills that were happening be, well, we don't have to worry about what's happening here. Our home is in heaven. And so oftentimes we were disengaged from the common fight. Um, you know, it's the story of the civil rights movement here in the United States where Black at Venice were not actively apart in mass with that movement because we believed that it was not our fight. Our home was in heaven. So I believe to start that it would cause us to recognize that God has called us to do his work now with the social ills happening around us. We would have an eye for what the oppression, the systems of oppression are around us. And we would feel moved to be a part of uplifting and alleviating that oppression. I believe that's the start. Wow. Wow. This is this is this is so good. Uh, I want to keep it keep it going, but we have to take a quick commercial break. Uh, if the if this conversation has blessed you, uh, put in the in the chat um, hashtag blessing me hashtag blessing. If this is is so far, if this discussion has been enriching to you, put in our post hashtag blessing me. If you have enjoyed, if you have enjoyed this uh, discussion, you won't want to miss decolonizing your mind part two, which will take place on Sabbath, September 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard, Standard Time. The panelists will be will be Dr. Ty, uh, Tyron Douglas, Miss Claudia Allen, Pastor Lawrence Souffrant. Pastor Michelle Moda and Pastor Jeremiah Sapolin. Additionally, we um, we provided our panelists with a list of resources that addressed uh, the issue of decolonizing our mind. To get access to that list and links to the associated resources, please go to my professional Facebook page. Uh, which is www.facebook.com backslash Sydney Freeman Jr. Uh, so now let's take a quick commercial break and we'll come back and answer some of, some of these questions. I know we can't get through all of them, but we'll try to get through as many as we can. Thank you.
Hello, we're back. Um, the the chat has been blowing up, so we're trying to uh, organize what questions um, uh, we can address within the limited time that that we that we have. So the first question is: uh, Black Seven Day Adventists are not the only ones experiencing the awakening. I'm 
watching folk like Lisa Harper, Dwight uh, McKissick, uh, even Beth Moore call out colonization, racism, and white theology. It's woven into everything, and I believe it's mastered by Satan himself. Uh, has any of the panelists, uh, particularly the pastors, have you been seeing your colleagues uh, address this uh, in any way? Faster, faster. Oh, I'm trying to see. Faster, faster. No, absolutely. Um, in my area as a pastor that all of us have heard of, uh, Dr. Howard John Westby, and he is doing an amazing job of leading a movement of people to call out institutional racism and to actually enlighten people, walking them through how to decolonize minds. So I think he's doing a great job. And um, I think it's also important to know that, that many pastors, especially our black colleagues, have been doing this work long term. You know, many of the civil rights movement uh, leaders were pastors. Um, so I am glad to see the Seventh Day Adventist Church you know, coming along and being a part of the conversation, but absolutely seeing colleagues who are awakening and sharing that awakening with their congregations. Yeah, definitely. I've seen the same thing um, in Black Adventist circles. I think sometimes there are, there are those who have platforms might use social media better than others. Those who might have streaming platforms that where you can kind of hear, you'll, you'll hear it in their preaching, you'll see it in their programming. There are those who don't have that, but yet they're still doing it. So you have trumpets that are blowing loud and you have trumpets that are not always heard, but they're still blowing the trumpet. In terms of our white counterparts, I'm beginning to see some awareness, some realization. Um, I, I'd like to see more, but you know, I, I think that we need to keep um, having the conversation openly and asking our white brothers and sisters in ministry to uh, to address this and not to be silent because silence is uh, definitely consent in this area. So what can what can I, I still want to kind of go back to a question that we we talked about earlier. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about some just actual practical steps. Um, what could our organizations be doing? Uh, what can our leaders be doing to help inform, help to move our 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 Black Adventist young people and all people, all of us, uh, forward in this in this idea of decolonizing our mind? Or is it their role to do that? I certainly the think- The power. Have, go ahead. Yes. No, no, I my mother wouldn't. <laughs> they have the reach to do so. I believe so. Um, and our media presence as Adventists has been um, them. So I think that if we had our scholars who understand the programming, um, Dr. Llewellyn would be one, to actually put together a curriculum for decolonization. Um, it would be wonderful to see something like that roll out to help us to number one, identify it, you know, because some of our comments have had some, you know, people have had challenges acknowledging that colonization exists and that the, um, the tools of colonization are what they are. So I think that we need to be taught how to identify the colonization and mm -hmm. then to systemically deconstruct it. So I think if we had our scholars come together and talk about what that looks like, and then for our institutions to roll it out, I think that that would be a perfect way to equip the, the masses. Yeah. Mr. Vanderhorst? Yes. Um, I believe that um, the power of the pyramid is in the base, not in the top. Mm -hmm. And it is said, and it is true, about speaking truth to power. I believe that we must speak truth to the powerless, to the base, because it is in the groundswell it is in, um, and, and, and it's a, a line that I have taken on personally, you know, it's just like, 
Uh, Vanderhorst, you ain't in the system, man. You ain't, you know, you're a pastor and all this other stuff, you know. Um, so by whose authority are you speaking? And I said, as the authority of a stakeholder. And when you understand, when people understand corporations, they understand leadership has to deal with stakeholders. And if they yes. don't produce, their heads roll. And I'll be honest with you, you know, a lot of uh, Black Adventist leadership's heads would have rolled if they were in a corporate world. That's another conversation, though. <laughs> but as stakeholders, the power is in the pyramid, and that's where the education is. That's where the information uh, should be concentrated. You know, blessings to leadership, whoever they may be individually, who gets on board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, if, if, if there's a, a waiting for leadership, you know, and we have to be honest, there are those who have ulterior motives. They just want to move up. You know, is it, is it a step backwards because you're not a conference president anymore? Now you've got to go back into a local church? Is that a hit against your ego now? Instead of getting closer back to the grassroots, back to the village, to the people. I mean, there are a lot of mindsets that we have seen over the years that are so polemic that to really try to coalesce leadership mm -hmm. is going to be a humongous task. But then I would say this finally for leadership who has the courage and insight. And that is the handing of the baton to these generations, X, Y, Z. Um, some of you know that on my Facebook posts, I've talked about provision or provisionaries. And I'm a boomer. And I say that it is the boomer's responsibility that when any X, Y, Z has a vision, it is our responsibility to make provision that their vision might be realized. So I believe that one of the most immediate things that, quote unquote, black Adventist leadership can do is become provisionaries to assist these uh, gens um, that are behind them in their visions that are yeah. community based, uh, spirit filled, anointed. Christ-centered kingdom work, following the mandate, the kingdom mandate of Luke 4, 18. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. And one of the things that um, Dr. Vanderhorst said that is true, I see, he's not just saying this, he's done this. He's been a provisionary for me and others um, whose names I could call, several names who we had visions, we had ideas, even my organization, Communiversity, he's the one who gifted that to me and said, hey, you know, run with this, you know? So th that's the kind of leadership that we need. And I also agree that the power comes from the base, even historically. So why did they kill? Why did the government conspire with those on the inside to kill Malcolm X? Why Freddie Hampton? Why Stokely Carmichael? Why all these? Because these were people who were not elected officials. They were not part of the power structure. They were speaking truth to the quote unquote powerless. Thus, the government knew, the government knew if we don't stop this, this in this educated, inspired base of people who quote unquote are from the bottom will rise and overthrow the top. So historically, it's always been that we have to do that. So what does that mean practically in our churches? It means the pastors who who understand this and, and they get with lay leaders so that we work together in concert, not against each other, but with each other in concert. We move the needle what happens with even who's in leadership. We change the, the, the way that we do ministry on the, on the ground. We change our perspective of even how money is changed. We can keep having this tithe conversation about the general conference. I don't think they're ever going to change it because it benefits certain people, it benefits them. So we have to then organize our finances, our economics on a local level and say, what can we do outside of this whole issue 
with the tide. And if that means economic disruption, if that means they get a little bit less than they're used to getting, then maybe that's what we need to do. As long as we're doing it for a mission focus and it's kingdom work, then the, the bottom is where the power comes from, not from the top. The folks who are part of the power structure have too much to lose. They've always had too much to lose. Therefore, the people who are on the bottom have to be the ones that make the change. Can Dr. I just add a footnote right there? Mm -hmm. People, I'm reading through the comments, they are so entertaining. Um, <laughs> people <laughs> believe that it is only pride that keeps individuals in office. And as long as we believe that, we are in peril. There are economic benefits to where I live and where other people live. And so being a part of ministry in certain areas means real economic um, kickback or economic um, offset for your family. The type of school that your children attend, how you're able mm -hmm. to purchase a home and to stay in that home and build equity in a home. And so a genius, and I say genius with quotations, a genius part of the system is that it actually uh, enables or disables people from speaking out because of the economic ramifications of speaking out. If I were to leave and if Doc uh, were to leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there would be a major economic impact to my family. You know, and so we have to also recognize that there are people who are holding on because they do not know where to go. And until we teach people how to fish for themselves, mm -hmm. how to establish themselves economically, how to build a business, how to have another source of income, we will mm -hmm. always be enabled or we will always be disabled from making moves. And understand that a huge part of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, acculturation for pastors is not having another source of income, not mm -hmm. having another area where you have learned how to draw in economically, not even having another uh, major that you've taken in college. And so it causes you to be um, less flexible or inflexible whatsoever. People are, um, are in, uh, I keep saying enabled, disabled. The people are disabled from making moves because they cannot afford to. And until we teach people how to fish, they will not be able to move. They will not be able to pass the baton. They don't know where to go. Wow. It's a big part of this conversation we have to have. That's true. Yeah. So that is true. Uh, were you going to say something, Pastor Knight? Well, I, I was going to say, and Van, Dr. Van Horst and I were talking last week about this, but he knows this. I mean, I, I had a taste of somewhat what we quote unquote call sovereignty. And, and the bottom line is, it's, it's possible. It's possible. The only reason I'm in the situation I'm in now is because the Lord led me, and I believe I'm here for this purpose right now within the structure. But I, I can tell you, and there are others who are, I know who are watching right now, who have moved from this structure in obedience, not in anger, not in frustration, not in enmity, because sovereignty, sovereignty does not equal enmity. They've moved in obedience with God and the Lord is blessing them. And I think more people need to understand that. And there is, and if the church doesn't understand, I, I think prophetically what Vanderhorst said, it's beginning to happen. There are people who are beginning to realize that my sovereignty can be and is obedience. It's not enmity with the church. And that God can bless that in every way, including economically. But we have to step out there. Sometimes the waters are not parted until you put your foot in the water. Mm -hmm. Well, Pastor uh, Kimberly Bolgen asked a, a question that I would like you guys to answer. Um, she asked, how do we come against the belief that you're not at Venice if we leave the institution? How do we biblically dismantle this, this idea? Can I say something I think is going to shake up this comment right now? You're not Adventist if you leave the institution, and that's okay. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. The, yeah. You know. <laughs> nomenclatures, um, labeling has been a big part of white yeah. supremacy and Americanism or um, Western, you know, thought, basically. Everything is labeled. You know, person, I call people without shelter, but they're called homeless. So if my car's not working for about five weeks, am I carless? Do they call me carless now or whatever? <laughs> you know, and I'm being wow. facetious here, but a lot of people can't get past labels uh -huh. or people, you know, have issues with labels. And I have a premise, and that is who decides and who decides who decides. If I wasn't included in the decision-making process, it's already been decided for me, and all I'm expected to do is conform, and if I don't, then I'm penalized. Well, I made a decision years ago that I'm going to decide, and I will deal with the consequences, and consequences are, are not always negative. So I'm going to put it out here for y'all, okay? I went into the Word to see what did Yahshua Messiah, what did Christ call the people? And when I got over to John 4, he said, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And that's what I call myself. I call myself a true worshiper. I label myself. So I don't need anybody else's labels. Oh, he don't call himself Adventist anymore. I can take you in the word and show you Christ called him that, you see. Can you take me in a word and show me your nomenclatures and your labels? Or are they an institutional construct? So, you know, we, we, we've got to decide. And, 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 and my mother said, who I think is the greatest thinker I've ever known in my life, she says, if it does not compromise with principle, it's okay. She said, if it's wrong the first time, then it's wrong every time. But if it doesn't compromise with principle, so be it. So when y'all see me, y'all say, yo, vendors, you a true worshiper. I'm going to say, <laughs> like, they say, like they say in Philly, my wife from Philly, like they say, yup. <laughs> but that's the mind piece, right, that we talked about earlier. What yeah. is attached to this label of Adventism that is so difficult that will even cause you to question whether you are a believer or not? It's mm -hmm. what's going on in your subconscious. You know, what do you truly believe about yourself and believe about God that you have attached to this label that without mm -hmm. it, now you see yourself as anti-God? That's problematic in itself. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I want to I want to throw this out there um, to kind of decolonize what I'm calling Black Adventism. Do we need to move towards a development of our own Black Adventist theology? Is that is there some theological? Do we have to kind of rethink our rethink Adventism fundamentally uh, to address the needs of our people. Let me just say very quickly before um, you get the genius uh, of, of thoughts coming in. As I said, Elder Nilly Fuller calls it the nine areas of people activity. So when you look at economics, entertainment, law, uh, religion, sex, which is family, war, and so forth, if those are functionaries of white supremacy and our black lives touch every one of those institutions, then I believe that we have to segment those particular institutions. Like if some people are working on the law aspect, if some people are working on the economic aspect, I believe that in sovereignty and moving forward, we have to look at those same entities that we are a part of to see, to strategize, to implement how we can now make these, make them to our benefit um, as a collective, as a black people, and if also you want to include Adventists in it. But those areas are what we operate in our lives every day, and we mm -hmm. have to deal with them. 
But can we have this? Do we have the sovereign mind? Uh, I have a friend here in D.C. and, you know, D.C. does not have statehood. And so yeah. on the license plates, it has taxation without representation. Yeah. But she <laughs> said that um, D.C. will never get statehood. And she said the reason is because statehood is a state of mind. And until you have the state of mind, you won't get the reality. Whoa. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Can you say that again? <laughs> statehood is a state of mind and until we get the state of mind we won't get the reality of statehood well the sovereign mind <laughs> you know we have to have a sovereign mind before we can have a reality of sovereignty you mm -hmm. see absolutely yeah and i think an answer to your question I'm still trying to. I'm still wrestling with the genius of, that is Vanderhorst. But, but um, I think that uh, this whole issue of of sovereignty um, and this mindset um, is vitally important. And, and I do think I do think that if we don't if we don't make uh, this a corrective of of Adventist theology, because Adventist theology, for the most part is it, we, we have a Eurocentric lens. You read the Bible in a certain way that always overlooks the existential reality, the suffering of marginalized people. In fact, we, we've actually been taught to read the scriptures in a way from a power, from a, from a, a superiority complex so that we don't really see the people um, mm -hmm. And we don't even see ourselves. And so, yes, I do think there needs to be a Black theological Adventist corrective to what we've been taught the whole time. And if we don't do that, we're going to get the same results because we've been talking about mental, right? So what we think about ourselves and then what we think about God, then it, it, it manifests itself in the structures we create. So we can be totally separate. Let's say every Black Adventist congregation, all of the regional conferences, Message Magazine and Oakwood University, uh, PFA, we all pull out. We're separate. If our theology remains the same, we're going to end up in the same place. Mm. Can I say that a lot of us are in trouble because, you know, we are discussing this deep theological work, but many of us are not even biblically literate. We have the benefits of other people who have done the theological wrestling for us. We have never gone to the word to understand what it is for ourselves. And that was never the relationship that God intended for people to have with the word. It was always mm -hmm. to first and foremost be a personal relationship with a personal wrestling so that God was personally revealing to individuals and to families his will for that unit. But because we have surrendered that work to others wow. who have masticated and given to us what they have choose, then we we get what they what they have. We have a theology that was built for someone else. I think that part of this work is us going to the word for ourselves to rightly defy the word of truth, line upon line, precept upon precept, going through the word to say, Lord, what does true worship look like? What does it mean yeah. for me to be a spiritual person and not a carnal being? What does it mean to deny my flesh? And as we start to ask God these questions and actually becoming spiritually fit, then God will, will certainly reveal to us a lot of the questions, the answers to the questions that we're wrestling with today as to what it would look like. It, can I just, just drop this in real quick? Um, for those who are still wrestling with this whole idea, this conversation around sovereignty, I want us to think about the fact that there is an entity that is that has a good amiable relationship with Adventism, but they are sovereign. And a lot of our people, black people, are pouring their money and resources into this entity that is not a GC entity. It is sovereign. They even hold their own camp meetings. 
but yet we don't seem to have any problems with 3ABN, who is sovereign, who is independent, who is a para-institution. Yes, they have an amiable relationship with GC, but they do what they want. And they oftentimes spew spurious and erroneous political ideologies that our people are swallowing. And yet many of our people are diverting their tithes and offerings to give to 3ABN, which is sovereign. So I want us to understand <laughs> we should have a problem with sovereignty because you already paying into an institution that is sovereign. Can we say that? It's, just, wow. it's just not yours. It's, it's just not yours. <laughs> I think Dr. And, Llewellyn and, wanted and, to say and, something. Oh, please. Now, in thinking of the DNA of the Adventist framework and the necessity for uh, a new one, Dr. Phil, uh, Dr. Holly Fisherman did a study years ago um, that really speaks to how Adventism is structured. So this historical apocalyptic eschatology focused primarily on the second coming of Christ. Uh, this sectarian view that as Christians, we don't conform to the secular world. Uh, this radical deterministic view of God, that God himself will be the one that di divinely intervenes in any human issues. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, this view that God or society remains constant until God himself comes down and moves and changes their plight. And so when mm -hmm. I when I read that study and I read her breakdown, it tells me that embedded within Adventist Adventist DNA is an erasure of black experience, black culture, black realities that we are constantly solely focused on the second coming only that we ignore uh our history, our present realities, and the experiences of our people. And so when we talk about um, sovereignty or we talk about the role of ourselves in the larger Adventist system, to remain with things as they are is to continue to perpetuate the erasure of our people. Mm -hmm. Dr. Joy DeGruy in her book, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome, such a powerful book, she talks about mm -hmm. vacant esteem. And you know, the the impact of uh, slavery, enslavement, the impact of colonization, the impact of ongoing structural oppression against peoples and how it literally erases and leaves us with vacant esteem, vacant identity, a vacant sense of self. And so when we talk about the mind and, you know, where we go next, we must understand that the framework that we are operating under does not support value or give place to all these other things that we're talking about and the realities of our people. I love that Godfather brought in uh, the ground because I believe the power is in the ground, but also the trauma and the healing is on the ground. Mm. And our people truly need to not just, we can't just sit and have lofty conversations without understanding the gross impact. Many of us are sheltered in Adventism in some ways, uh, whether that's economically, whether that's in the collective here. But when we leave these walls and we go into the larger community, which we cannot erase or ignore from this conversation, the the impact of vacant esteem is very real. Um, and there are people who are living without any sense of hope, any sense of future, any sense of who they are. And so it is imperative. It's critical that we create some alternative to how we engage Christ and engage ourselves spiritually that can really get to the core of vacant esteem as it's impacting our people, not just in our church, but in our, in our community, in our society. Wow. Yeah. I, wow. I, I, I encapsulate everything that's being said um, under these three constructs, and this is just mine. We're talking about a theoretical framework, we're talking about a theological framework, and we're talking about a therapeutic framework mm -hmm. as it pertains to decolonizing the Adventist mind. And that theological um, framework is all of them are important. Um, that, that therapeutic might be rudimentary, that, might, that has to be foundational. Um, however, in that theological framework, it, it, there has to be, you know, serious paradigm shifts and so forth. And, and the truth is this, and, and there are people who may not agree with it, but heaven is not our home. 
That's not even scriptural, but it's been said. Heaven is a thousand year vacation. That's it. Boom. That's it. We have been created for earth. We have been created with the divine mandate of Luke 4, 18, to open eyes of blind, set a press free and so forth on this earth. Thy will be done on earth. As it is in heaven, we are to prepare people for earth. One brother probably said it best using a sports analogy. He said, Advent is just trying to run the clock out. <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but we are to prepare people to live here for earth. That's where social justice comes in. That's where kingdom work comes in. However, it's going to be through, let me say, through the kingdom mandate of Luke 4, 18. However, it will transition to an earth made new. Mm -hmm. So we are to prepare people. We're not no escapist theology. In fact, the scriptures also tell us that after those thousand years, after the thousand year vacation, Earth made new will be central. Wow. So where are we trying to, trying to, you know, we don't have to do work here. The Lord's coming soon. And all of this. Well, anyway. You know. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we do. This is, this is our call on earth. And so, therefore, we have the mandate. And then I will say this finally. At this present time, and all of us know that we have black brothers and sisters in these regional conferences who have the expertise economically, um, who will finance and fund, you know, intellectually, all of the areas of expertise for a powerful, sovereign movement and establishment. Wow. I believe that. I do believe that. I think it's in our mind. <laughs> you know what I say? Emancipate yourself from mental slavery, man. This thing runs so deep. I truly believe that the resources are there. We are holding ourselves in bondage in many ways. I attended my first ASI a few uh, years ago. Um, say what that is. What, what is ASI? Adventist <laughs> Servicemen International. It's, 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 it's for power church ministries. Right. Thank These you. are people who are Seventh-day Adventists who run businesses that actually bankroll sovereign ministries. Uh, if you talk about, we talked about earlier on um, 3ABN, if you're talking about Amazing Facts, if you're talking about David Asherick, and you're talking about Ty Gibson, these individuals have relationships with people who are Seventh-day Adventists and who are philanthropic, who pour money into their institutions. So they, these people, uh, Amazing Facts, is not actually connected with the Seventh-day Adventist church technically. They People are need to know that. Yeah. They are yeah. sovereign. They get donors who pour into amazing facts and they work, they're called a parachurch ministry. They walk alongside the church. I was amazed at how many physicians and business owners and multimillionaires, if you ever have had a life case on your iPhone that was created by a Seventh-day Adventist in Australia who sold it for $7 billion and now funds ministries. And so what all of our big some of our big evangelists do is they create relationships with these individuals who fund their ministries so they do not have to be organizationally tied to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So know that this dynamic is already happening around us. We are simply not in the spaces where these hands are being shaken. And so when we talk about this, what Dr. Llewellyn says is true, it is possible. There are people who we know who are individuals who are of means and who have a mind for the kingdom and who would happily give to something that is happening along with the young adults in your church who would happily give to a bus that is moving it is our mindset that makes us believe that we are not responsible enough 
to run a church. It makes us believe that we are not responsible enough to be biblically sound, but that is errant thinking. It's errant thinking. I am a seven day Adventist pastor. I want to make sure I say that. I am employed. <laughs> but I know that I am here not because I have to be here, but because God called me here. And when God calls me elsewhere, then I have to have the presence of mind and the faith in God mm -hmm. to say, I will go where you lead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. This yeah. is this has been uh, been powerful. Um, I know I know I've already set up for for part two, but I think I'm going to have to bring you back in part three. This is this has been this has been wonderful. Um, if you guys have been blessed by um, this afternoon's presentation, can you I, I've been I've been saying put things in the chat. Ha so, hashtag sovereignty. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, put that back up. <laughs> yeah. Then we'll see who got the courage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, put in there hashtag sovereignty. Um, I would like to thank our panelists again, Dr. Tiffany Llewellyn, Pastor Lola Moore Johnston, Dr. Charles Wesley Knight, and Minister Ronnie Vanderhorst. I also want to say a, another special, a special thank you to uh, Mr. Kirk Nugent and uh, yeah. Composition for facilitating uh, facilitating this uh, for uh, for us. And of course, I have to say it one more time, thank you, thank you to uh, my wife for her support in uh, in this process. Uh, I, I know uh, Elder uh, Vanderhorst is going to have to leave soon. But we wanted to make sure that before we closed out, that uh, we would ask that he would uh, offer a blessing over over us before we concluded uh, our discussion. Uh, I'll give what I what I want to do just before that. Um, I wanted you guys to have maybe one, each of you have one minute just to share any just final uh, closing thoughts that you would have want to leave with the people before we conclude. So let's start with uh, Pastor Johnston. These are the last days. Get in your word and connect it to Jesus so that we make it to the end. All right, thank you. Pastor Knight. Everything that we talked about tonight, uh, this afternoon, requires courage and, an, uh, and, an, uh, and a willingness to be able to suffer and pay the price. No great change comes without great suffering. Mm. Wow. Past, uh, Dr. Llewellyn. Yeah, um, you know, we talked about so much. I just want to encourage everyone to really pursue their healing, really get into the core of um, the impact of so much of what we talked about, particularly in the Black community. Uh, that healing is going to be crucial to us being able to take this to the next level. When we talk about implementation and where we go next, at the core of that is how we truly uh, dig into our minds, our body, our spirit, and be able to heal ourselves. Uh, and lastly, I, I'll just leave what someone asked me. <laughs> What are you willing to lose for it? What are you willing to risk for it? Um, because it certainly comes at a cost and it comes at a risk. And so that's the question we must all ask ourselves. So Elder uh, Vanderhorst, uh, please give us a, your parting uh, synopsis and then feel free to flow right into the prayer. Okay. Um, I'll end by quoting my wife's brother. The day is fast, the time is late, it's a dangerous thing to make one mistake. The earth is in a five o'clock rush, Babylon is here with confusion as such. Men and women both look alike. Truth and lie are having a fight. The wise are called foolish, the foolish are called wise. People are living in many disguise. Words and voices are at their peak. Woe to he or she who's still asleep. The day is fast, the time is late, it's a dangerous thing to make one mistake. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful for Dr. Sidney Freeman, Jr. Mm -hmm. And what you placed in his spirit. We just pray, pray blessing over him and his wife, his home, over his call. That you would expand his capacity to make a difference in the quality of lives for those who 
are in the sphere of academia and, and, his, and his wife's influence. And then, Father, for the rest of the panel, you said before we call you an answer, and while we are yet speaking, you will hear. So I thank you that you have gone ahead of each of us and our families to do what you know we need done. And we give you glory and honor. And finally, Father, for those of the listening audience and those who will share this, this uh, offering today, that you would do exceedingly abundantly above all they can ask or think according to the power that works in them. We give you glory. We give you honor. We bless your name. We praise you. You are a sovereign. You are a salvation. You are our sanctification. You are a savior. Glory to your names. But for our sake, amen. 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 All right. Well, thank everyone for being a part of this afternoon's panel. Uh, please don't forget to like the Facebook page, www.facebook.com backslash Sydney Freeman Jr. And also to subscribe to my YouTube page and visit Dr. Sydney Freeman Jr. .com for resources and announcements regarding similar resources and planning. Continue to be blessed.